In the previous two videos on how to play I Ain't Been Shot Mum, we looked at the basic games, the cards, the blinds, spotting, movement and big men. In this one we're going to concentrate on combat, both firing and close assault, and also the results of firing looking at shock and morale, and then we'll finish up by having a quick look at artillery. So first we're going to look at the combat that takes place in I Ain't Been Shot Mum. Firing is going to be the most usual way that you attack the enemy, so we'll cover that first. A target can be attacked as long as the firing unit can see them and the target isn't a blind. The same way that a unit spots a blind is the same way they decide if there is firing allowed. That means there can't be any intervening terrain that is impossible to see through, or the target is within 4 inches of a wood for example. Also, sections and turreted armoured fighting vehicles have a firing arc of 180 degrees to their front. Machine guns, anti-tank guns and fixed gun armoured fighting vehicles have a 90 degree arc to their front. The target has to be within that arc to be eligible to be fired at. There's no maximum range for most of the weapons in Iron Bean Shot Bomb. The ground scale allows for firing to take place across the board if there is an unobstructed view to the target. However, this will be a rare occurrence and most firing will probably take place at close and effective ranges. Firing is conducted by individual sections or weapons teams and there is no combining of fire allowed. But once you have assessed your target and measured the range, the firing player decides on how many of their actions they're going to use. Each action you use allows you to roll one dice on the firing table. As you can see, the table is broken into columns, with the dice score on the left. As we move right, it is broken into close, effective and long ranges. Below this are smaller columns in each of these categories. These are labelled Great, OK and Poor. The players, between them, decide on how good a shot will be. Many factors will affect this rating. For example, a target stood in the middle of a field with no cover could be rated as a great shot. However, if it's absolutely pouring it with rain, you may want to increase this to an OK shot. A target hiding in thick jungle may be a poor shot, and so on. It is impossible to list every single situation you'll ever find on the tabletop, and there's no hard and fast rules with this rating. It's up to the players to decide between themselves what the ratings mean to that particular point in the game. The dice adjustments don't just stop there. As mentioned in the rules, you can make firing as simple or as complex as you want. You are free to add your own modifiers and shift through the columns as you see fit. There are various other modifiers. This depends on what weapons the sections are armed with, how much shock the unit has, etc etc. Firing is also affected by big men, who we covered in the last video. When you're using a big man's command initiative to direct fire, you will get a bonus for every level of command initiative that he has. The final number rolled gives you the effect of the firing, and it's read off from the column on the left. Dash is no effect, a number shows how many hits the target has taken, P is a pinned result, which means the target can only fire this turn and is unable to move, an S result is a suppression, which means the target is unable to move and fire for the remainder of this turn. When we know the amount of hits the target has taken, we roll one dice per hit and consult the hit effect chart. A score of 1 or 2 is no effect, a score of 3 or 4 is a point of shock, and a score of 5 or 6 is a kill. For each kill result, a figure is removed from the target. Remember that reducing the amount of men in a section or a weapons team will also reduce their actions. For each point of shock, a marker is added to the unit to show their current level of shock. I use these dice holders with a casualty, but anything else will work. Shock is the measure of morale in IMB Shot Mum. As most units will not fight to the death, shock determines what a unit will do under fire. Each point of shock on a unit will not only reduce its effectiveness in firing, but also reduce the maximum it can move. This is when it is useful to use your big men to try to reduce shock on units under fire. Armoured fighting vehicles that suffer enough shock may actually be abandoned by their crew depending on their quality. A section or weapons team will also lose their bottle if they take more shock points than they have of figures left. The result of this is automatically and they generally immediately withdraw if they are in the open, light cover or in buildings. The speed at which they withdraw is determined by the true quality and they will continue falling back every time they take more shock. There are some circumstances in which a unit which has lost its bottle may rally. A big man can do this as part of his actions, as can the rally card, if it is included in your deck, or if the unit is also classed as a diehard. These are pretty rare and they're usually scenario specific. The other form of combat that infantry will generally find themselves in is close combat. This occurs when two forces come within four inches of each other. This can happen when both sides are deployed on the table, or if either or both are still blinds. Close combat is simple and very brutal. Each player adds up the number of men involved in the combat, and this will be their initial dice pool. You will then add or subtract dice depending on the close combat list modifiers, by working your way down the entries on the list top to bottom. Each player will roll their final number of dice, every roll of a 5 or a 6 will kill one of the opponent's men, with a 6 also causing a point of shock. 
The unit which has taken the most losses will fall back a set number of inches depending on how badly they lost by. If it is a draw then the two sides will fight again, up to a maximum of three rounds. Close combat is ugly, brutish and short and should only be done when you know you are able to outnumber your opponent to your advantage. High explosive firing against infantry uses a similar method as infantry versus infantry firing. Simply put, the calibre of the weapon firing will give you the amount of strike dice you will roll on the hit table. Rolling ones will indicate a missed shot, but anything else is considered to have hit, and the casualties are dealt with as with infantry fire. However, any unit that is hit is automatically pinned by the fire. Frighteningly, armoured fighting vehicles and guns can fire like this with each action they have. Direct fire against armoured fighting vehicles is also slightly different. Each action the firer has will allow for a shot. The first shot is always considered to be aimed, and any subsequent shot will be a snapshot unless an action is used to aim. Two dice are rolled, modifiers are added and subtracted, and the result is checked against the to hit value and the range and cover the target is in. If a hit is achieved, both players will roll a number of dice, the strike value of the firing gun and the armour number of the target. If the number of strike dice that are scored are equal or greater than the armour dice that are scored, then you consult the damage table. Generally three or more hits will destroy the armoured fighting vehicle, anything less may damage a weapon system or an engine for instance. Armoured personnel carriers and soft skins will take less to destroy them. Infantry firing their man portable anti-tank weapons against vehicles will also do it in a similar fashion, using the strike value of the particular weapon they are firing if a hit is achieved. Indirect fire from off-board artillery is handled differently again to all other firing and I been shot mum. It involves several steps over a number of turns. Pre-registered artillery is called by adding a support card to the deck at the next tea break. This is generally done by the most senior big man or forward observer requesting the fire. When the support card is drawn, the barrage will fall on an aiming point on the table. The fire will continue every time the support card is drawn unless a battery ceases fire or the fire is redirected or cancelled. Opportunity fire is handled slightly different as it is a snap call from a big man or a forward observer. As before, when requested, the support card is added to the deck on the next tea break. When the card is drawn, the player must make a test to see if the fire will arrive. This test is dependent on the nationality of his force, and some are worse at calling in artillery support than others for historical reasons. If support fire is called in, the player places their first ranging shot on the target they desire, and then rolls for the deviation dice. If a hit is rolled, the artillery is on target, if an arrow is rolled, the target is deviated, and the player rolls a certain number of dice depending on their nationality to give them the amount of inches the target point moves. If the target is hit, then the battery will fire for effect. However, if the aiming point is missed through deviation, then the player can decide if they want to fire for effect or try to range in the target during a future turn. The effect of the fire will depend on the size of the battery firing and the calibre of the guns will define the number of dice rolled on the hit table. The final type of artillery is the pre-game stonk. It's a barrage fired prior to action taking place. Usually these are allocated depending on the scenario and will be used on a defender once he is set up. Each one covers a 12 inch square and you simply dice on the stonk table to see the effect of any unit under the barrage. These are very good for softening up a target before the assault. So this covers the main aspects of the rulebook and gives you a good idea of some of the more usual aspects of the game work. There's a lot more within the rules though, including snipers, battlefield features, aces, army lists and scenarios. It's a richly detailed set of rules that isn't too prescriptive and don't bog down during play. Players are left to iron out disagreements in play between themselves. As the Lardy's tagline says, play the period, not the rules. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and keep watching this channel for more wargaming content.